That URL on the bottom there um, is just a link to a Google document that has a lot of links and resources we'll talk about today. Or if there's any questions come up and other resources we need to add, we'll throw them into that group. But um, you can copy that down now or we'll show it again at the end of the presentation. Anything else is by way of introduction? I don't, I don't think so. Um, yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead and get started. Okay, so yeah, I'm Kimberly Snow from the Department of Special Education. I am not from um, their department. I am an instructor here on campus. So the examples I'm going to show you, and maybe you can relate to them, is as an instructor um, presenting usable information to the students. So I'm going to be a bad example, and then through Christopher, I've become a little bit of a good example in something. So I'm going to give Christopher um, a lot of credit for this. So my experience when I first started school, well, for graduation, I got an electric typewriter and thought that was really nice from high school. We all know this, right? And then we use this little floppy disk thing. And then when I first started teaching, I used the projector, the overhead projector. And we changed the transparencies and all of that. And we have come so far to the technology is unlimited. And it's, it keeps getting even better. And so we really need to stay on top of this as instructors a little bit more. As we address accessibility, these are students that I've had in my class that needed some kind of accessibility um, component to their education that I was responsible for. I did look at my students, and throughout the years, I've had all of these students. This isn't just a list, but I've had all of these students um, in, come through my class. Uh, from ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, those are on a 504 plan. Our students that sit in the back row, that would have been me. Uh, military service, so, uh, students who were in Iraq. And those that undisclosed disabilities also, that I didn't even know what disabilities they had. And that was overwhelming to me, knowing that I had to make this information accessible to them. And as I started thinking about when I make it accessible to them, I'm really making it accessible to all students. All students are going to benefit from whatever I do to make my courses a little more accessible. So that's a, that's a big thing to remember that, you know, it's good teaching practices. All students will benefit from this. Kimberly, that last group, Undisclosed Disability, it's just important to remember that just because you don't get an accommodation letter one semester doesn't mean you don't have a student with a disability. They may not have requested accommodation for your class or a large number of students with disabilities choose not to disclose their disability for whatever reason. And so a lot of times you'll have students that are just struggling to get by and trying to make things work as, as much as they can. And so doing some of these things really is going to help um, them, but, but as well, like Kimberly said, everybody in your classroom. Nice. More students than ever, more students with disabilities than ever before are attending post-secondary education. So 11% um, is about the statistic for nationwide. Utah State University last year had 1,994 students that they provided additional accommodations for. About a third of those, 25%, were those were with psychological disorders. Learning disabilities was 23%. ADHD was another 21%. And then other low, more low incidence disabilities. So Utah State has those statistics say, well, of course we have students with disabilities in, in attending post-secondary education. It's a learning process. My courses are definitely not perfect, and they are progressing as I become more knowledgeable about it. But it is a process, starting from that projector where now I am to a, a higher point of accessibility. So we need to take that as a, as a learning process. One, as I said, I'm going to be a bad example, as well as the progression or the evolution that I've taken in my course. One was closed caption fail. We, I'm so happy that you just put, click that CC and it works and I don't have to worry about that. That's not always the case. Here's an example. This is a mom doing a little puppet show to her daughter. Uh, this is kind of stuff, but I was wondering if you join in nuclear plants died. That's what the computer thought the mom was saying. And that's what we present our students. 
This next thing, and we'll start at, at about 44. This is kind of a, a entertaining example, but let's just watch this. These guys are going to have a conversation of what they want to say. This is their conversation, and then we're going to take a peek at what the computer actually saw. And we'll show later how there's a better way to do captioning. This is where, <laughs> again, you can't rely on kind of that machine captioning just yet. <laughs> Hey, man. Hey, I've been trying to read you for the past hour. What have you been doing? Oh, nothing. I was just polishing my Little League MVP trophy. Is that a euphemism for something? Uh, no. What are you eating? A 100% organic, free-range, black bean vegan burrito. How can a black bean be free-range? I don't know. Google it. You'll never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Uh, an iPhone? I got tickets to the Lady Gaga Putt Putt Tournament of Monster Truck Rally. With the opening act, Little People with Piercings? Yes! I can't believe it. You're my best friend, man. When do we go? Actually, I'm not taking you. I'm taking Elise, my eight-year-old niece. You mean the niece has been trapped in that goat cheese making cult in southern Venezuela? Well, it's a llama butter making cult in South Carolina, but yeah. Well, next time you want to call me and not invite me to something, they just don't call me at all. Well, next time you don't want to be happy for me when my niece is released from a cult and gets to go with me to an amazing concert, don't answer your phone. Fine. Fine. Hey, man. Anytime we put that style, what you been doing? Well, nothing, which is polishing my Little League MVP traffic. Resenting you for missing to something? No. What are you eating? Or 100% organic, free-range, but the Indian retail. Part of my baby free-range. Parallel to collect. Never guess what I'm holding in my hand right now. Marathon. Advantages to the Lady Gaga puppet to name us a drug right. Would the opening at Little People would be a sensor? U.S. But do you believe it? Your best friend. When we get Actually, I'm not taking it to get at least nine-year-old niece. You mean he's been trapped in a goat cheese making calls a network? Was a lot about meeting. Construct a line of the year. Without anyone calm united by minister to the so-called me at all. Well, next time you don't want to be happy for me, woman eases release from a cotton disability to an amazing concert donating your poem. That's, Five. you know, it's an entertaining Five. example, but it's, it's very realistic. We need to be careful about the information that we share through a video and the closed captioning. Make sure you check it out, and then as Christopher said, he'll address some of that information on how we can make them, make it more correct. So that was one error that I made, and now I've evolved. Another one is my guided notes. I used to, when I began, handed out hard copies. Well, that was good for, for the majority of students. They liked a hard copy. Then I progressed into, well, let me print them off as a PDF. Well, not all screen readers at that point are now can read the PDFs that I was providing. And we'll go over more PDFs in just a minute. But as far as my guided notes went, that's what I was providing them was a PDF. Not real accessible for all of our students. Then I moved into something that some people are a little uncomfortable with, is sharing their guided notes in a PowerPoint form. Now I put my PowerPoint up for them. Then that gives them the option of using their screen reader, which follows the PowerPoint very nicely. But it also allows students, if they want to print out one slide per page, they can. If it's easier for them to print out three slides, six slides, or nine slides per page, they can do that. If they want the font bigger, they can do that. It makes those guided notes very accessible. And a lot of times I'll also include my notes on it so that they can go back and read the notes. Any notes that I took on the bottom of the PowerPoint, they can print off notes too if they would like. So that was another error, error or progression. Another one I didn't think about because I didn't understand this. My brothers are colorblind and I should have known this a little bit better. I would divide groups, oh yeah, you and, you know, in the red group, you do this assignment, you look at these words, so on and so forth. And I did not realize that this is not what they're seeing. Over here are the actual colors, but here is what someone who is colorblind is seeing. So you see the red group, well, look, red, brown, black, orange, green, they all look, not red, but they all look similar. So I needed to be a little more careful with that. Here's an example, a more functional example. Here's some wires. Here's the different colors, connect the colors together. But someone who's colorblind may see more of this, not functional at all. 
So I need to be careful how I use the colors. Not only, I, I did it for aesthetics type of, of reasons, but um, I use different styles now that we may address now or later, the bold italicis. So I use that so that the screen reader can read that and so students could see that. Real quick, th there are some legal things you need to be aware of. But we we want to mention these, but not focus on them too much. There is a university policy now, some national laws, and again, we have a disability resource center on campus that who stand at the ready as far as those legal issues are concerned. And so be aware of those and, and know of those that that is a reason. But, but, but while you need to be mindful of that, I do think there's, there's some far better reasons that we can look at to be motivated to do some of these changes. I want to talk just for a minute about the curb cut effect. Uh, curb cuts, this is where the sidewalk meets the road, right, uh, used to not exist until the Americans with Disabilities Act was, was passed and they required or mandated curb cuts being put in place all over the place um, for, for users in wheelchairs, for example, to be able to get from the, from the sidewalk to the road. Now, now there's a lot of moaning and groaning when this came out, a lot of costs, you had to get concrete saws out to put these in, but it turns out curb cuts are available to, are, are helpful to a number of additional people besides just uh, people using wheelchairs. Shout out some, just real quick, think about when you use a curb cut or when you see other people use them. Bicyclists, good. Who else? What? Stroller. Elderly. Elderly might use them. What's the other one? So my kids come to school. In a wagon, great. Yep. You don't have to have them over that curb to get there. Transporting something in a cart. Yeah, so a cart with a dolly. All kinds of reasons that it turns out curb cuts are useful. And so there are some types of accessibility things we may need to do that are going to be more specific to certain disability populations. But today we're going to kind of focus a little bit going forward on things that you can do in your, in your online class that are going to be helpful to students with disabilities, but are also going to help all of the students in your classroom. And just keeping in mind these, what we may call canvas curb cuts, you know, are going to make your content more accessible, but also just more usable and learnable to everybody. So with that background, um, mm -hmm. real quick, so sorry, mm -hmm. got you mid-drink. Uh, yeah, sorry. It's important as we look at the, everything that may need to be done by accessibility and to not get too overwhelmed by it. Yeah, I had to draw that line in the sand and say, you know, I'm going to start right here. I'm just going to do like Dr. Tobin talked about this morning, the add one. I am going to start, and this semester I'm putting out my guided notes. That's it. PowerPoint guided notes, that's it. But as I create my PowerPoints, I'll make sure the color's addressed. Because it is, it can be a lot of work to do it all at once. So I just started with that, one at a time. I drew that line in the sand and started not overwhelming, because it can become overwhelming. And then make a goal for the next semester. Well, now I'll do closed captioning. That's all. That's all I'll do. Yep, and we've got help here available to whatever you're doing on that. Okay. Um, and so along those lines, remember that this is a journey. It's not something as accessible or not. We're working to become more accessible, more inclusive. And so wherever you're at um, on accessibility, as far as thinking about what that is in your class, just think about again um, what the plus one is or what that next step is that you might take. So with that, let's start with captioning real quick. Um, we should look at some bad examples of captioning earlier from, from Kimberly. Um, and what we're talking about here is just that, that on the bottom of almost any video um, that is captioned at least, you'll see a little CC button. And some of your videos may already be captioned for one reason or another, but all you need to do is click on that video and you'll see the words to the video that show up. Now captions are going to be essential for someone who is uh, deaf or hard of hearing, right? But again, like with the curb cut example, what, what other instances are captions helpful for students or, or for you even in particular? Shout, shout out some answers, please. I had a student uh, complain about my clicking when I was giving a video. She said it her. So she was able to turn off the audio and just well, watch the captions. captions. If so you I did have captions, you would have captions. <laughs> Good, what else? If you got to listen in a sort of noisy room. Yeah. I mean, I have kids. I have closed captioning on the TV all the time. Yep, well, absolutely. That's same in our house. Poor little kids running around. If you do your presentations with a British accent, it'd be really handy. <laughs> there you go. Did yeah. you notice on the library that you have that? Yeah. You get the journals read in British But that, but it, yeah. um, a little bit in jest, but certainly for second language learners, captions can be a really big deal. Yeah. Or in a foreign language class, perhaps, to see the words while you're hearing them is a big deal. I think in 
international students, and I don't want them to be reading. It's a listening class. They have to listen and understand, and they cheat by using the <laughs> <laughs> So that's even the case. The captains can certainly be turned off on demand, if, even if they are available, and so let us know on that. On demand. Thank you. I think a lot of young people uh, now are used to streaming information in multiple channels. So might, they might be sitting in a bus listening to music and looking at your video. Right. And then it, it allows them to do that yeah. with the content we provide. Oh, well, that's great. Maybe we can just be grateful that they're listening, they're watching our presentation captured while they're watching Netflix, whatever it is. <laughs> okay. Good. We can go on and on. There's a lot of value to captions. Even instructionally, there's some surveys that kind of demonstrate that seeing and listening at the same time can be helpful. Go ahead. So if we produce videos, you know, either of ourselves talking or, or if we use video lecture capture or something at City, is there any way to get those captioned? Ding, ding, ding. Thank you very much. Yeah, perfect. If you have any videos you need to be captioned, just shoot me an email right here. We are able to provide this to you as a, as a free service for instructional videos. The current requirement, though, is we're looking at videos that you do plan on using over multiple semesters. Um, certainly, if you have a student who needs it, we just are on that and we'll get it done. Um, for other videos, if it's just a one-time use, you know, talk to me if it's something that's really important, but, but just as we look at our budget and how we use that the best way, we try to kind of identify first those videos that you do plan on using over multiple times. So some lectures we may not, um, now there are different levels of captioning. That machine captioning can be available for free for any video, uh, but, but you may, you know, it, and then if you're willing to go in and make edits or um, deal with the, the kind of experience you saw, it is getting better and better, but it's certainly not, not perfect. So it seems to me what happens is, you know, we create our, uh, at least for me, sorry, online stuff. You create, you do a video of your lecture, let's say, but it's not closed captioned. And you're like, all ready for the semester to start. And in week one of the semester, you get the request for a right. student that says, hey, I, you know, you know, maybe I'm deaf or whatever the case is. Can we just say to you, okay, wow, this is di the week one of the semester. I now have a student that requires this. So I need captions on all 15 or yep. 20 of my lectures, and you guys can do it that fast? Yeah, you know, and so video, videos can be captioned in as little as three hours. Okay. It's a little bit more expensive, so we prefer to have a little bit more um, lead time. You know, a seven day gets okay. us to our cheapest uh, availability, but certainly. But if you get one of those letters that say, hey, you've got a student yeah. that needs I mean, generally, you should get those letters before the semester starts, but in case a student might switch a class or something, and then you will okay. get it the first week. Right, right. But usually, yeah, get, shoot us an email, and this is, that's just what we do. We have a crew that just churns through videos, get some captions. And they can also be a YouTube video from another source. Um, really, wherever the video comes from, we can get that done for you. Um, and there's some other cool things coming that will be available with captions. It allows people to download the transcript, for example, if they want, or... Um, it's just, it's just a great feature to have on videos, and more and more students are coming to expect it. Just a shout out to you, because I dealt with that over the summer, yeah. and I was really worried about that, because I was like, I am recreating this class as I'm going, but mm -hmm. I would send them an email about once a week and say, all my videos are ready, go for it, and there was never a problem. Thank you so much. We try to stay on top of it. And again, we appreciate a couple days lead time if we can on those videos instead of posting the day of, but we work with you, <laughs> do the best we can. Good, so I hope to get some emails from some of you. The next thing I want to talk about real quick is PDF content. By far the most popular mm -hmm. type of content across all of our Canvas courses, more so than Word documents, presentations, or Canvas pages. Let's just look at a couple of samples. <laughs> okay, I see a couple of heads train a little bit to the, to the right. Unfortunately, we have teachers who also go the other direction, right? So you can get your neck uh, doesn't get too cramped. Um, or even sometimes all the way up to, up to, now these are all real PDFs, so hopefully from none of your courses, if so I apologize. But, but this is fairly common. We also see something like this in a PDF document that, that, that may, it's not just a screen, if you zoom in on that text, that's what it is. Um, ironically, on this one right there, you can see the chapter of this book is designed to challenge the curriculum. <laughs> These PDF issues are very common, and again, we, we haven't really known what we could do about this in the past. It's been, a, it's been a big issue, and I think even recognizing when you have a nice, clean PDF, and a student opens it on their mobile phone, which they do, it, it's, it's, it's just not an ideal reading experience, right? So, one of the things we're able to do and help you with, um, and we'll show some examples of this in Kimberly's course, but taking a PDF like this, and there's a tool that I'll show in just a minute that is able to convert that PDF to a web page, 
and you can put that web content directly into your Canvas course. Um, and so now instead of students having to download a PDF or, or mess with orientation, they can simply open it in their Canvas course like any other content. Here's another example of a PDF. Again, it doesn't look too bad and it's probably readable, may use up a lot of toner, I guess, but um, <laughs> put that into Canvas, and then you open up in your, on your mobile device and you've got a nice, clean reading experience. Please. What about um, the copyright? Good, we've so touched base with our copyright. A website. I was like, Ooh. Yeah, we've touched base with our copyright librarian on this, and the general feeling, uh, we haven't taken it all the way to legal counsel though, but if you have permission to use the content, a chapter of an article or something, then it's, it's going to be fine to put that in a different format. Um, and again, happy to have more conversations on that. They've given us the thumbs up to go ahead and go forward for now on that. We've done a few hundred files, and um, so far the feedback from students and faculty has been really good. So um, I have a lot of papers that I want my students to read. Some of them are very, fairly complex, and so I have kind of uh, notes I, that I add into the PDF itself. Yeah. Would those notes transfer over? On, on they would. We'd have to do a little bit of cleanup to kind of how they integrate into it or not. Okay. Um, okay. You know, maybe even if you're not going to go this way, even just taking a, a minute to go to the library and search for a cleaner version of the PDF, they have, the library has so many incredible resources, and a lot of their files are going to be more accessible right from the get-go. Yeah, I have a question about this tool. Like, is there, like, if you're using, like, a really large PDF, like, say, uh -huh. like, I'm assigning, like, three chapters of a textbook or something. Right. Is it going to hang up on files of a certain size? No, it does a pretty good job. It'll take a little bit longer, but you're still going to be within a couple of minutes that it'll convert it um, and make it available to you. Let me go to that tool real quick, and then we can come back. It's called Ally. Um, and it is available right now in your courses. We're, we're looking at rolling it out. Um, there's kind of a student-facing part and then a teacher-facing part. Um, but right now, in any of your courses, wherever you have a document, PDF, Word, presentation, if you click on that little blue arrow that students click on to preview or download it, there's now a third option called Alternative Formats. If you click on that, it allows students to download any document from any of your courses in any of these formats. Um, now, it's not going to be perfect, but, but it does a really good job, and we'll, we'll do some cleanup of the files, but, but the, you can see HTML, EPUB, the one that a lot of students get excited about is that they can take your 10-page paper and listen to it on their way home from work or when they're out on their morning run. Try this out, um, see how it works for yourself, but, but this is the tool we're using, and it is something that's available to your students and that many of them are already using in Canvas. A couple of questions. I was just going to ask, to get this, all these formats, we have to send it to you to do that? Nope, this is just in Canvas. If you open up your course and Already. go to a file, um, click on that little blue arrow, and I can show anybody afterwards or over at the city offices, happy to meet with you anytime. Uh, in the back and then purple shirt, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, we're talking like a PDF of a peer-reviewed published paper, and the audio is available? Yeah. It, it's like the electronic it's voice magic. reading it? No, it, yeah. it, it is electronic voice, but it's a pretty good quality. Um, I don't have a sample right here to play, play for you. Um, now, if the, if, the, if the file is really awful and, and, and not very well organized, it may not be a great quality audio. And that's a, an incentive, perhaps, to clean up your documents. But for most documents, it does pretty good. And, and you know, try it out and give it a test. It works with math as well, um, late, late late LaTeX, um, for those of you that are math. So it can read later? Yeah, and, and it can even format PDF content into LaTeX as well. Um, try it out, I've heard mixed reviews on how well it works, and again, based on the quality, but if you're interested in that, again, so you should be in Try it out, exactly what do we do to try do, it? Yeah, so do you want to? Kim's course in yeah. a minute, and we'll look at a sample there if that's all right. So just I'm trying to get your recommendation for uploading material onto Canvas in terms of slides, right? Just PowerPoint. PowerPoint is going to be much more accessible and usable for most students than, than a PDF. If you like the PDF for some reason, maybe make it available in addition to if you like slides on a page or whatever, but students can do that themselves as well. Um, start with the PowerPoint, or, or whatever the native form it is, Word or whatever, is always going to be a lot better. Back here, and, and, I'll come and in PowerPoint, you can make your slides longer. I mean, you can make mm -hmm. an eight and a half by eleven sure. slide out, mm -hmm. out, out yeah. on the PowerPoint. Or Word, yeah, we, yeah, that's a good thought. What question? Right here? I have some PowerPoints that are that I have already narrated. Uh -huh. Can those be captioned? Yes, wow. depending on the format, but it, as long as uh, send me an email, and it should be fine. Okay. Um, we may convert it to a video. I'll have to look at that and see. But anything. Okay. Audio, video, we should be able to get captioned one way or the other. 
Okay. Let's look at a couple of other things. Talk about this one. Okay, the consistency and organization. All of my courses look exactly the same, and we're going to get into my course in just a minute. Students appreciate that, and they know what to expect in your class if everything is organized the same way throughout, so there's no surprises to them. And I want to take time to get into the class, yeah. We're going to look at this. You'll see my organization here. The evolution that, that, that you've talked about as far as learning and growing and changing, there's been a lot of good things that have happened in this class that we're excited to show off. Give us a tour a little bit. Tell us about the front page and then we can go through okay, a couple of examples. Well, this is the front page. <laughs> um, I don't know what you want me to, to tell exactly about this. So everything's organized the same way. Once I click on each one of the weeks or the lessons, depending, everything's organized with tabs. Here, there, there we go. Everything's organized with tabs, and that's an option. Screen readers can read this so students don't have to go through that whole entire page to finally get down to the comprehension check. They can go through and then screen readers can scroll through that. So not only does it benefit those who use screen readers, but any student, the organization, all students, that's going to help out. And as they get in, everything is um, organized the same way within the tabs. Go ahead. Yeah, so just right here, this is where um, the course used to list the link to those PDF files directly that they would download. Instead, now we go to, um, we've converted all that PDF file to um, a, a Canvas page, and so you can see that same content there. That was an article. That was an article that I had that I would link, and it's, it's, made, it's turned it into that. Here's another one. Um, sometimes we'll link to the PDF at the top of the page still if needed. L let me go real quick to your files just to show that alternate Kay. format. Anywhere there's a file that you link to in your course, um, there's gonna, in fact, let me see if there's a page. We've eliminated most of your files. I know. <laughs> um, I've cleaned it up a lot. Let me just see if I can find one. Which, Canvas has a cleanup tool that's we'll not part of, real quick, so. okay, it's really nice. Um, well, here's one right here. So, so if you see um, a file anywhere, you'll click on that little blue arrow, um, and then click on alternative formats, and then you can go ahead and just click download. Now, the first time you do it, it takes a minute to generate the audio. But every time after that, so you'll see this one. I don't know how long this, this file is. It'll take just a minute. Any time after that, though, for your students, it would just be instantaneous. So that happens fairly quickly. I'll just go over for a second um, while that happens. But again, now, now that this PDF content is Canvas, you could can also track it if your students are visiting those pages or not, something that you can't do with those files as well. Anything else you want to show? No, I just have all the files linked up here. I don't send anyone to my files, and I don't send anyone over to modules. I just keep them all linked the pages onto Canvas so students don't have to go into that file that he just mentioned. I don't know if anyone, I know some people still use the files. Yeah. Um, you can hide the files, but they can still get to them. Yes. What, yeah, if you hide the yep. files. So one of the challenges with the files section is we found across all Utah State courses, less than half of the files that are in the files section are actually being used. Yeah. Now one of the yeah. challenges is there's never really been a way for you to figure out which ones are being used or not. And so the, the tool that Kimberly mentioned a minute ago is called this file cleanup tool. We hope to make this available in all courses, but for now just shoot me an email and we can turn it on for any of your courses. What this does is it shows you a list of all the courses in your, all the files in your course that do not have any links to them. Um, and so, so right here we can go in and see that in this course about 55% of the files, but there's probably a few we can delete. But I thought we did a lot of it, but we'd have to... We did. Oh, I thought we did all of them. Um, you can just select all of those and click delete if you want. Um, or you can come over here to look at all of your files. Um, and you can either click on it to preview what that file looks like. Oh yeah, that's an older file. Um, or you can click here to see where that file is used. Um, this one, you can say, oh, there it is on that page. So this is, this is a brand new tool that um, just, we're just taking kind of out of beta and is available to try out. So, so we'd love to show you that if you're interested. And some of those that say no is, I might use them. And so I put no, but I also know that I can go into past courses and, and upload it or import it into and my course. No so I'm not worried case. about it. Yeah, no pressure. We're not saying you have to delete these, but just if you want to, it helps you know which ones you want to delete. Please. So maybe I just missed it, but I don't understand how she got her article 
actually embedded into her Canvas page. Yeah, there's a, so, so the process, just in a nutshell, is that you use that Ally tool. I'll just go to the file section. Um, and I would go to a, a document, and I download the, um, the HTML version of it. Uh -huh. um, and then I move that HTML into Canvas. And I won't go into everything. We're working on making that a one-click process. We're not quite there yet. So right now there's a little bit of HTML you have to know, not much. Um, it's the kind of thing that we've brought students up to speed in a half hour. Um, or if you have a student assistant, or we can help you out with that on at least some of your files to start with. Um, and, then, and then that downloads an HTML file. There you go, you can see. So this was a Word file. I didn't, this was just picked one out random. Um, and you can see that it turned it into this HTML file that's then easy to just copy and paste into Canvas. Okay, thank so that's you. the way that works. And I'm happy to sit down with anybody and go over. I'll, I'm gonna, I, don't, I haven't tested this audio. Let's just play this one real quick and we'll see. Just so you can get a little bit of a sense of what that sounds like. Oh. Begin heading level one. Section 504 and ADA. Begin paragraph text. Spat 4000. <laughs> Image without alternative description. Image without alternative <laughs> description. <laughs> Begin paragraph text. Guidelines for educators and so that's the type of experience we're going to get. It's not like a professional narration, and it's going to depend on your source content, but but it can be pretty good for, for most of your files. Anything else in the course to, to peek at? Um, I mean, really, just for students to kind of know each week what's going to be there, what sections are going to be in the content is a really big deal. I mean, again, for someone with ADD or ADHD, yeah. with the mental, just this kind of consistency and, and good design is just going to be a, a tremendous resource for a lot of students. Um, is your please. contact information on those contact cards? Yes, uh, so, um, I, I believe it is. I'll show you our slides at the beginning. There's okay. another slide at the beginning, and that will show bring that up again. Anything else in the course? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Um, Without overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, there's just, it's, it's just um, there's been a lot of work that's been done, and we're really excited. Let me open up our slides real quick. It crashed on us for a minute. We're almost done. Um, okay, go ahead. Young adults with disabilities, they just want any person that has any type of a disability, they just want what their typically developing peer want. They want access to information. They want to learn. They want to be educated. They want a degree. That's why they're here. So they just want access to the resources and um, the contents that's usable to them so that they can have what the typically developing peers have. And that's our responsibility. I'm very passionate about my topic. And I'm very, I teach students with, dis teachers who will be teachers of students with significant cognitive disabilities. I take a big responsibility to students in the public schools that have disabilities by giving that information to the students I teach. That's a lot of students. I don't know if you follow that, but I take that very serious. And so this also helps me feel a little bit better that I am making that information usable and accessible. So. Thank you so much. And, and really for this, I mean, there are systems and processes in place but if a student comes into a classroom and from day one they just see that the content is already accessible, that just sends an incredible message to those students that, that they matter, that they belong, that they can be included in all of your class content all along the way. It's, it's a really big deal. And Kimberly is so passionate about that. I hope nobody gets overwhelmed. Again, it's one step at a time. And this has happened over many years. Yeah, right? that yes. We've been doing yeah. this work and getting more and more accessible. And also know there's a lot of help available. But, but that as you focus on accessibility, really getting out of that mindset of uh, an accommodation letter, I have to take care of this, to thinking about what are the things I can do that are going to make my classroom more accessible, uh, my content more usable, and just that experience more inclusive to everyone. And there are a lot of those things that you can do that you can do today that are going to really make a difference. Um, that's really it as far as our presentation. There's again our, our contact information. There's more contact information and resources. Links to all those tools we shared um, are available on that page right there. Um, but, but feel free to reach out and, and with any questions that you have. We'll stick around afterwards if there's any questions as well. Thank you so much.